Okay, so this lecture will be on electrical stimulation techniques. So using some of the basic terms that we talked about last lecture and really applying them to the different forms of electrical modalities. So understand, be able to select different types of electrodes, lead wires, different placements, and pain control muscle contraction using electrical stimulation. So primary effects of electrical uh, therapy are to the result of the depolarization of sensory, motor, or pain nerves. All right. In this chapter, we will learn how to adjust the parameters to obtain our therapeutic goal. Really to create the optimal environment for healing to occur. Your body circuit contains excitable and non-excitable Tissues. Excitable tissues would be nerve, muscle fiber, cell membranes. These are influenced directly by electrical current. Non-excitable tissue, bone, cartilage, tendon, fat, ligament, do not respond to current flow and may be indirectly influenced by electrical fields caused by the current, but they're not influenced directly. Nerve, muscle fiber, and cell membrane are the excitable tissues. And remember, uh, electrons and electricity flow in the path of least resistance. Amperage and voltage must be sufficient to overcome the res total resistance of a circuit. We have something called electrical uh, electrode leads. These connect the electrodes to the generator, then transfer the current to and from the patient's tissues. So if you look at electrical stimulation unit, these are the lead wires that plug into the unit in one end and then have bifurcation typically and go out and plug into the electrode pads that are attached to the patients. All right. So two leads are required to complete the path. They can be bifurcated allowing for multiple pairs to be attached. Um, these are actually regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. Um, you must have jacks or plugs that prevent unintended contact between the patient and the power source. So these are bifurcations. This is a picture of, a, of an electrode uh, lead. Each one of these is a lead. All right? They have bifurcations. So this is probably channel 1 and channel 2. Right? Or channel A and channel B. It depends on the manufacturer of the unit. So the part you can't see here would actually be plugged into the machine and then these guys get plugged into the electrodes that then get put on the patient yeah so these whoa, 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 whoa. these are photos of this is a photo I should say of different electrode uh, jacks so the one on the left here this is actually not the kind that you see very much anymore because this um, plug if you accidentally walk past and you, you hit your foot or hit your arm on the electro lead, this would actually unplug pretty easily from the unit and can cause some actual serious electrical issues for that patient. The one on the right here is uh, has three prongs, if you can see, within it, and that plugs directly into the unit. It's a lot more difficult to unplug. So this is the one that you see a lot more often now. Um, pretty much the standard in most electrical modality units. So let me back up here and click on, uh, oh, that's the video uploaded to YouTube, electrode, uh, electrical modality unit. This is a modality unit. This is an electric or intellect uh, legend system from Chattanooga. Chattanooga is the, probably the most common company that you see. This itself is the base unit. You can see this is uh, the screen, the buttons here. There are touchscreen ones out now. Um, yeah, so you can turn on the unit, select what type of stim you want to use, and then go through all the parameters. Right? These are kill switches in case the, you have a, the patient has an issue. The electro leads, of course, are not on here. Um, these things range in price from anywhere, um, you know, a thousand bucks to you know seven, eight thousand dollars. So they're not very cheap. So that lead wire plugs into an electrode. The electrode is formed of metal or carbon impregnated silicon or rubber. This introduces the current to the body 
uh, from the stimulator unit, so the generator unit, via electrodes forming a closed circuit, depending on the form of stim, right? When electrodes touch the skin, that is where the ions are charged. Ion flow consists of positively charged sodium and potassium, right? Moving towards the negative pole and negative ions. Chlorides move towards the positive pole. So if we know sodium and potassium moving towards the negative pole and chlorides move towards the positive pole in a form of stim such as high volt, we can put the positive and negative pads in a certain place and force, if you will, that sodium potassium moving towards the negative pole, chloride towards the positive pole, change the polarity of cells, and therefore help improve the optimal environment for healing to occur. You'll hear me talk about high volt a lot. I like high volt. Primary resistance to the flow of electrons, or electrical flow, if you will, is the skin. All right. You place the pad on the skin. To form a closed circuit between the generator and the tissues, one electrode from each lead must be in firm contact with the skin. Ooh, if it's not in firm contact, so say this is the electrode, bam, on my skin. If this bad boy is lifted up a little bit, it's going to cause some pinching, some pain um, underneath where that pad is. And I, I'll have a better example here coming up. Um, yeah, properly prepared and positioned pads increase the efficiency of the current. Again, if they're not in firm contact with the skin, most new machines will actually um, have an alarm a safety mechanism built in that once you hit a certain uh, current, millivolts, whatever it might be, depending on the form of stim, it doesn't go any further. It shuts down because the, the, the electrode is not in firm contact with the skin. These can create hot spots that you can actually burn a patient or cause discomfort. You can give the patient a little electrical burn and a blister. When I worked in West Virginia, one of the athletic trainers I worked for, uh, not for, worked with, actually gave an electrical burn to a football player that she had hooked up on STEM. I worked football, but I did not. I was busy with doing something else with another patient, and she hooked him up for me, and then she ended up causing an electrical burn. I was on the low back, huge blister, um, not good, right? So resistance, right? We have the stratum corn corneum and the electrode. As thickness decreases, resistance decreases. So as thickness of the skin decreases, the resistance decreases as well. There's something called parallel. This is formed as ions pass through portals in the skin, glands, pores. Right? Water, gel, or self-adhesive electrodes efficiently transmit current to the skin. In my next picture coming up here, another slide or two, we have these things I'll show you carbon electrode and self-adhesive electrodes. The carbon electrodes deliver the most current at the lowest skin impedance, about 200 ohms of resistance, but you almost never see carbon rubber electrodes anymore. Um, one of our clinical sites at a high school up in Vermont, um, he still uses the carbon electrodes. His modality machines probably from, uh, I'm not even kidding, 1981, 82, it is old. It barely passes inspection or calibration every year. It scares me. Um, but he still uses the carbon rubber electrodes. Most places use the self-adhesive electrodes. The most common, right? Conductive gel is part of the electrode. They produce more resistance to electrical current flow. and becomes uh, more uncomfortable during treatment and increased burning sensation. Um, depending, right? So self-adhesive electrodes are awesome when they're first bought and you first put them on for brand new out of the pot package for the first time. After a few uses though, depending on the brand, um, they lose their stickiness and they're not as good. I feel like most self-adhesive electrodes nowadays kind of suck, honestly. You might get five uses out of them. Ooh, these are all examples of carbon fiber or carbon, uh, not fiber, carbon electrodes. Huge, oops, excuse me, this is a huge guy here, right? This would be like a dispersive pad. We'll talk about dispersive pads in a little bit. These ones at the bottom here are more common sizes that we would use. Even these guys here, uh, these, you know, they come different sizes and shapes. This, this is still pretty big. 
Um, but think about you're trying to hook up a patient on electrical stimulation on their ankle. You're not going to use this guy or this any of these. You might use something smaller, maybe one of these. This actually looks like a, a self-adhesive electrode. I can't tell. Um, let's Google self-adhesive electrodes images. And there we go. These are self adhe Oh, no, what I click on? I don't want to buy anything. These are self adhesive electrodes. There you go, bestseller examples, right? They come in different sizes circular, rectangular, oval. Um, yeah, they come in four packs, two packs. Ooh, these guys are snap adhesive, so those are different tens unit ones. So this is a good example of a circular one you'll, you'll see in clinical practice. This little end right here and here, that's where the electrode lead wire plugs into, and then you place these on a patient. Okay. Whoop, that's Camtasia. That's how I record your lectures. Okay, here we go. Metal electrodes. <laughs> Yeah, I've actually seen some of these. These are pretty scary. You use moistened sponges to complete the connection to the skin. Whoa, these are very scary. So you actually, so let's back up. With the carbon electrodes, you would actually use a piece of sponge as well, moistened sponge on top of the carbon electrode to help um, with the current flow. Same thing here, metal electrodes, you would use... Um, a metal or a sponge of some kind moistened to complete the connection to the skin. These things are scary looking. They will burn you. And yes, size does matter. The decades uh, old debate. Electrode size does matter. Contact with skin influences current density, comfort, and muscular tension. Most electrodes have a maximum current density that must not be exceeded. These are included on the packaging or should be included on the packaging of all electrodes. When I taught this class last, uh, and of course we're going over this slide actually in the lecture, and I pull out our electrodes that we had in our, our outside training classroom, and of course our package did not have <laughs> the maximum current density. I love it when things work out like that, right? So this is an example. Um, you have the machine plugged into the wall over here, all right? This electrode lead wire is plugged in, and it is getting 300 volts of electricity from the outlet. You're using a 10-inch uh, square right, pad. The current density on the pad, I know it's red, is 30 volts per square inch. Pretty big pad, 30 volts per square inch. Right? If we use a smaller pad, right, the generator, the, the unit, the intellect unit still sitting here, same 300 volts, but we use a pad that's half the size. This is actually a pretty common size for electrical pad, electrode pad. It's now getting 60 volts get into the body. Whoa! So the bigger the pad, the less volts. Why? Current density, uh, more surface area for that current to be spread up, out upon on that electrode. So this electrode has less current, uh, less surface um, area. So therefore, the less surface area will increase the amount of volts. So you have to remember that. The smaller the pad, the more volts you have going into that pad. So now imagine that this whole pad is not connected to the patient firmly. Only this little portion here is connected to the patient. Instead of 60 volts, maybe that's 280 volts. That's going to hurt. Same thing. Maybe this pad isn't fully attached to the patient. Maybe this, this little bit is. Maybe that's you know 250 volts because the size of change of size in the electrode. Smaller electrodes require less current to stimulate tissues than larger electrodes. Why? Well, I kind of talked about a few 
What other things can you think of in your head? Resistance to current flow, impedance by the skin, decrease as size electrodes increases. So if you're worried about the resistance of the impedance by the skin, bigger electrode decreases that. But most places for some reason don't necessarily purchase the larger size electrodes. That electrode right here about the five inch uh, pad is about the most common size that you'll see. Okay. So electrode size, I think that's about it for now. Electrode placement. We have different stimulation points throughout the body, more conductive to electrical stimulation than other areas. We have motor points, trigger points, and acupuncture points. Motor points. What's a motor point? Huh. If I want to create a muscle contraction in my biceps and I know the motor point's here, I can place a stim pad right here, all right? Dispersal pad somewhere else, and I can create a muscle contraction and back down. Bam. Bam. Right? If I have a trigger point. So a trigger point, you push into a tender spot, and that causes pain somewhere else. Versus a tender point, I have to sneeze. Okay, it's not going to come. A tender point, you push into, and it only hurts in that spot. Trigger points. Most people have trigger points in their upper neck, all right, in their upper traps. You push on a trigger point, it might cause wrapping headache or pain up here. If you place the stim pad directly on the trigger point, you can actually get rid of the their headache and decrease that trigger point area. Proximity of electrodes next to each other, to each other really, influences the tissues that are stimulated and depth of, chit of tissues. Uh, not sorry, not depth of tissue, depth of stimulation. Closer together, the current flow is more superficial near the skin. Further apart, depth is increased. As distance is increased, depth is increased. All right. If we know the direction of muscle fiber, current is four times more conductive. So if we place it going with our biceps muscle, if we place the pad going this way, right, versus this way, if I do it this way with the muscle fibers, four times more conductive. That might become important when we talk about muscle contraction stem, right? So this is more superficial, right? They're closer together, therefore more superficial. They're further apart, therefore it goes a little deeper. Okay, bipolar technique. This involves use of electrodes having equal or near equal size. They're, they're both usually located in the target treatment area. Since they're equal, equal amount of stimulation should occur under each electrode. So if our goal is to reduce motor point pain, would both electrodes be over it or just one? Really just one, right? If you have one motor point, you'd place one electrode over the motor point. If your goal is to elicit muscle contraction, I would actually find both motor points for that muscle. So I know the biceps, right? Biceps, brachii. This flexes my elbow and supinates. So supination, pronation. So my biceps supinates and flexes. So I also know it goes from my radial tuberosity up here to my intertubercular groove, my, uh, my, my uh, labrum. I could place one at the origin, right? And then I can place one directly in the muscle belly to try to get a stronger muscle contraction. This is a photo from the book. It's a weird photo. They have electrode A, lead B, and you hook them up. Yeah, you don't need that. Two pad placement for bipolar, right? Bipolar, two pad placement. Monopolar technique involves classifications of electrode, two classifications of electrodes. One or more active electrodes placed over the target tissues and a dispersive electrode used to complete the circuit. Without that dispersive electrode, you do not complete the circuit and you will not feel the stim. Typically with monopolar technique, 
you have one pad placed over the tissue you want and then the dispersive pad somewhere else. The surface area of that dispersive electrode pad is large, at least two and a half times larger than the total area of the electrode, active electrode. So if I go back, 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 that big boy right there would be a great dispersive pad. We typically see this one being used as a dispersive pad. Monopolar technique. The active electrode is placed on or near the target tissue. So say I'm doing my quadriceps. I place the pad right on, the active pad right on the spot I want on my quadriceps. And the dispersive pad is placed elsewhere, either opposite muscle group, my hamstrings, or my low back, my belly, wherever it might be. That high current density focus treatment TX treatment affects under the smaller electrode. This photo is actually shown two active electrodes versus just one. And you can do that if you choose to. I think the more common method is the one active electrode. Quadrupolar techniques. Four pad. Quad four, right? involves the use of two sets of electrode, each from their own channel. Essentially, this is concurrent application of two bipolar circuits, and this is classified as interferential stimulation, or IFC, interferential current. Your channel 1, lead A, lead B. Channel 2, lead A, lead B. Electron flow is flowing between these two pads. The movement of current, once electrical current enters the body, the movement of ions replaces the flow of electrons. Ions move away from the pole having the same charge, right? Opposites attract, like charges repel. That is Column's Law. Move towards the pole having opposite charge. AC or pulse by phasic current is used. Uh, the ions move between them. So if I'm using alternating current or the pulsed biphasic current, ions move between them. If, D if DC current is used, all right, bam, bam, ions only move in one direction. Hmm. So if I want to deliver medication through the pad or electrode, right, that makes sense to use DC current. I place the electrode on where the pain is, the tendinopathy, usually like tennis elbow, like lateral epicondylitis. Pad right here. Bam. Disperse the pad somewhere else. Hook it up. That electrical current's only going into the elbow, not back into the machine or back down here. It's going into the elbow. Right? Ooh, nerve fibers. Ah, remember that handout I gave you on Blackboard? Stimulation of nerves. I like these A beta, A delta, and C fibers. You need to know the diameter, uh, conduction velocity, but stimulus level for depolarization. To stimulate an A beta fiber, it's a pretty low level of depolarization needed. A delta and C fibers are high though, right? So understanding these A beta, A delta, and C fibers is actually pretty important. I have the handout, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna, it's uh, on Blackboard, we did it last week during some pain, we even did it during, yeah, pain, I guess it was, um, and even did it during pathomechanics of healing. So nerve types are depolarized in an orderly, predictable manner, and response to electrical stimulation is ba based on three factors. One, diameter of the nerve, so size of the nerve. Two, depth of nerve rel relative to the electrode. And last, the phase duration of the current. Sensory nerve fibers are always stimulated first, followed by motor nerves, and then lastly, pain fibers. So if a patient is having pain, right, I can hook up a form of stimulation to the electrical stimulation to try to stimulate uh, override their pain fiber to decrease their pain. 
you get some dopamine release and norepinephrine and all those different things as well. But essentially, we're trying to stimulate, override that nerve fiber to decrease their pain. Only after those structures on the, the previous slide reach the depolarization threshold, then electrical current can directly affect muscle. Large diameter nerves are depolarized before so, uh, smaller diameter nerves. So if I look at this, large diameter and low, therefore my A beta fiber, right, is going to be uh, depolarized before my C fiber. Don't C fibers carry dull pain, right? Hmm. So if I'm having that dull, toothachey pain, it's going to take some time to depolarize the C fiber, right? And because it's so small, it's going to be one of the last ones to really feel the effects of the electrical stimulation. Okay. We have this thing called subsensory stimulation. This stimulation occurs between the point at which the output intensity rises from zero to the point the patient first receives a discrete electrical sensation. So when you hook up the machine, bam. It's all set up, you're turning up the, the volts, milliamps, whatever it might be for that specific unit and form of stim. You're turning up the current, let's say. The subsensory level is that first area that that patient uh, feels the discrete uh, sensation. It's between that and, and, and zero. So it does not appear to cause any therapeutic benefit for that patient because you're not depolarizing any nerve fibers, right? So we're going to get in depth into more sensory level stim and, and some other um, motor level uh, stim here. So sensory level stimulation depolarizes only sensory nerves. Makes sense, sensory level. This level is found by increasing output to which the point uh, slight muscle twitch is seen or felt and then decreasing the output intensity by about 10%. So the output intensity is how much you're turning up the machine, right? So say you turn up the machine to 100 volts, decrease it by 10%, that's when the muscle twitch is felt, and then you decrease it by about 10%, that's that sensory level stim. You turn up the output until the point at which a slight muscle twitch is seen or felt, the patient may feel it, you may not see it yet, and they may not see it. And then you decrease it slightly, that's a sensory level stim. A motor level stim makes sense, is stimulation intensity that causes a visible muscle contraction without causing pain. Let's back up, sensory level stim, all right? Motor level stim causes muscle contraction. High volt can do this. Russian stim definitely will do this. And then you have noxious level stim. Stimulation is, uh, stimulation is current applied at an intensity that stimulates fi pain fibers. Okay, that makes no sense. I can't type apparently. Stimulation applied at an intensity that stimulates pain fibers. Mm. Many times this is what our goal is of electrical stimulation is to decrease the pain that the patient is having, right? So we need a noxious level of stim to override that pain mechanism, if you will, to, to you know decrease their pain, to stimulate those pain fibers. Muscle fiber or fiber level uh, stimulation is applied with a long phase duration, all right, long phase duration, and output intensity that causes multiple fibers to depolarize. So you're trying to reach that depolarization threshold, that action potential, you know, negative 70 millivolts, that subsensory level, maybe it's only reaching negative 40, negative 30. It's, it's not enough to cause depolarization. But in this muscle fiber level, we're trying to hit that negative 70 millivolts for multiple muscle fibers to create this fiber level stimulation. There's a cumulative effect as the intensity is increased. First the sensory, then the motor, then the noxious. What does this all mean? What do you think all this means? In your heads right now, think about what that means. 
I may actually put this as a discussion board topic. Oof. The strength duration curve. And you can see, yeah, I added notes here at the bottom of the strength duration curve for you. Um, it's up there on the lecture on the PowerPoint um, on Blackboard. So I'll just read this here. Due to capacitive resistance formed by cell membrane, short pulse or phase durations are more selective in the nerve fibers uh, stimulated than pulses having a longer duration. Shorter duration currents require increasing amounts of current to stimulate the same type of nerve fiber than currents having a longer duration. Okay, A beta, A delta, and C fibers are up top. This is the current strength in milliamps. So a 0 to 1 milliamps, this is a subsensory tens unit, or subsensory unit uh, form of stim. That patient doesn't really feel anything and not many effects are occurring. This bottom portion is a phase duration. So the longer the phase duration, the different form of uh, effect, if you will, it'll have, right? So at the bottom here, you can see this word called sensory. So it has a shorter phase duration. That's going to be more sensory nerve fibers. And according to our chart here, this is an A beta fiber, right? From about 10 to about 100 microseconds. What does this actually mean? So on the actual unit, when we're manipulating variables, we can change the microseconds from 10 to about 100, a range, and that will stimulate more A beta fibers for a sensory level stimulation. Am I losing you? Hopefully not. This next one here we see is a motor level. It's a short window. A motor level stim is about 200 to about 250 microseconds. Longer phase duration than a sensory tens, but a short window compared to sensory tens, right? Sensory tens are about 90 microseconds. Uh, motor units or motor uh, level stim is about 50 microseconds. Uh, um, so a motor unit is now being contracted. We hook it up, a motor level stim is occurring, so we might see a muscle twitch, neuromuscular reeducation, a Russian stim, right? We can even manipulate this into a greater range from 200 to 400. And especially about 250 to 400, that gets our A delta fibers, right? So let's review. A beta fibers from about 10 to 100 microseconds that stimulate sensory nerves. In the A beta, you see HV written here. That would be high volt stim. 40 to 50 microseconds is really the stimulation point for high volt stim. Within the motor unit here, the motor level stem, I should say, 200 to 250 microseconds of a phase duration. You can manipulate this on the machine to cause a motor level contraction. Um, even TENS units and neuromuscular uh, reeducation units can go from 200 to 400. Just to directly stimulate the A delta fibers, about 250 to 400, but really anything in that range from 200 to 400 is getting the A deltas, but that 250 to 400 is getting the A deltas even more. Why is that important? What does A beta fiber do? What does A delta fiber do? Isn't A delta sharp pain, if I remember correctly? Huh. C fibers, ooh. C fibers, you notice, are milliseconds, milliseconds. These are the noxious level stim all right so it's anywhere from 1 to 100 milliseconds and that gets our C fibers 
how many people are confused right now? Raise your hands. Again, I can't see your hands, but raise them. Um, okay. If you're confused, stop. Text me. Email me. FaceTime me. If it's 2 a.m., don't do that. Wait till tomorrow. Okay. We're going to talk here. CNS and PNS, central nervous system and peripheral nervous system interference. When cell membrane remains unchanged, the resting membrane, uh, potential of the membrane rises above its pre-stimulus level. We call this accommodation. Peripheral nervous system's automatic response is called accommodation. It occurs when nerves rate of depolarization decreases while depolarization stimulus electrical current remains unchanged accommodation occurs that patient you hook up the stem it's going on them next time you hook them up well maybe you have to turn up a little higher that's why accommodation habituation hmm. this is actually from my class last semester habituation is the central nervous system process of filtering out a continuous non-meaningful stimulation that stupid noise in class every day at 9.15 a.m. Oh, I hate this noise. In our classroom, outside our classroom, I should say, literally, I taught this class Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Our trash company picked up trash every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9.15, and the trash uh, you know, receptacle bin was outside our classroom window. So every day at 9.15, we would hear the beep, 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 of the truck backing in, then the noise of it getting dumped into the truck. I would hear it and I'd get annoyed being the you know faculty member up in front of the class talking. But the students actually started filtering this out. Then he realized this when I talked about this in class that they were habituated, if you will. All right? Habituation and accommodation occur during the application of an electrical modality. Let's say you hook up the patient, you turn the stem up very high, walk away. Five minutes later, you come back and ask, are they okay? Can you turn it up? Most will say yes. 90, 95% of people will say yes. Why? Accommodation, right? Occurs nerve rate depolarization, decreases, stimulus remains unchanged. And habituation is filtering out unwanted or, or un, non-meaningful stimulus. Accommodation, habituation. Bam. I feel like I'm rolling gossy every time I say bam. Okay, medical galvanism. Galvanic stimulation is the application of low voltage direct current to the body. You know the polarity under each electrode. The pH of tissues, excuse me, under the cathode becomes basic. pH levels. Hmm. If it becomes more basic, you actually increase the risk of a chemical burn with a direct current. This can elicit a muscle contraction from denervated tissue or muscle. C, uh, yeah, C, C fibers are stimulated, making contraction painful. In the book we use, this should be the top paragraph of page 249 unless I'm using the older edition. Uh, why would this help decrease nerve irritability? Think about it. What in the world is this chart? This chart's actually pretty good. So we hook up the electrical current to the body. Ions flow through the body. That depolarization threshold is reached. No. Let me change my pen color here. Let's go black. If it is not reached, it is a sub-sensory level stim, right? Because the depolarization threshold is not reached, the negative 70 millivolts, right, is not reached, let's say. Therefore, it's a sub-sensory level. This is either direct current or monophasic current. It's a negative current. It has a decreased pH. Oh, antibacterial effect, which could enhance wound healing. Uh, clot reduction, collagen synthesis, right? Um, the positive anode has increased pH. Therefore, leukocyte and macrophage activation, proliferation of 
epithelial cells, right? So the subsensory level actually does have some effects on wound healing and initial healing of uh, the injury. I went back to clear the, the, the pen, pen color, black, cool. So then if I do a, if the depolarization threshold is reached and I turn the stem up to a sensory level, depolarization of these A beta fibers, the phase duration, <coughs> excuse me, between 10 and 100 microseconds, we can have high pulses per second, a long treatment duration, 30 to 60 minutes. This activates that substantia gelatinosa. Isn't that part of the gate control mechanism of pain? Yes, it is. This closes that spinal gate, so it's not a second order, right? It doesn't go up to the central nervous system, the, the, the higher brain centers, I should say. And that, in turn, causes pain reduction. Essentially, it's a gate control level of pain, gate control theory of pain. If we hook up the stem to a motor level, this causes depolarization of these type 2 motor neurons. Phase duration of between 200 and 400 microseconds. If you turn it up to high pulses per second, if you manipulate the variables in the machine for high pulses per second, muscular tension is developed and overload occurs. So this can delay muscle atrophy. Hmm. If I just had muscle or some kind of surgical procedure done or I'm in a cast, um, in a walking boot, I can delay the atrophy or decrease a muscle tone by using a motor level, high pulses per second, right? I can reduce swelling this way. Awesome. Muscle re-education. I just had a surgery on my ACL, let's say. My quadriceps the size of uh, my pinky. Tiny quadriceps. I can hook up the motor level stem to create a muscle contraction to delay atrophy, increase muscle re-education. So the brain, my brain's connection with my quadriceps, back that loop, connect that negative feedback loop. Low pulses per second, if I manipulate the variables for low pulses per second, I can have an encephalon and endorphin released. Huh, isn't that another pain control theory? Hmm. Am I, you see how I'm trying to connect the dots here? If I do a noxious level stem, Again, A delta fibers, I do low pulses per second, short treatment duration. I activate my central biasing uh, mechanism on pain control, and therefore I have pain reduction. Ooh, this chart is actually very good. I usually hate these flow charts, but this one is good. Check mark, check mark. Next. Okay. Motor level stim, the combination of the pulse rise, duration, current amplitude, determines the quality and quantity of contraction. So we have phase duration intensity increases the recruitment of motor nerves. We call this spatial summation. The pulse frequency increases the rate of muscle contractions per unit of time. We call this temporal summation. So spatial summation, summation adding, right? The spatial aspect of adding these um, motor neuro nerves is the phase duration and intensity increase the recruitment of these motor nerves. And then to have temporal summation, the pulse frequency increases the rate of contractions. So one, we have to increase the amount, and then we increase the speed. E-STEM, electrical stimulation, is used to create tension in the muscle to prevent delay muscle atrophy, reestablish that neurological pathway from our brain to the muscle wherever that muscle is inhibited, restore the strength of inhibited muscle, and increase muscular length. System of innervated, innervated muscle activates the motor nerve rather than muscle fibers directly. Strength of contraction is based upon the number of motor units recruited in the firing of motor units. So if I use motor level stim, I hook it up on the motor unit, Bam, strength of contraction is based upon the number of units I recruit and the firing of the motor units. What do you think is going on physiologically? Well, sodium potassium pump is occurring. This is back to A&P. So that muscle is not being used at all, so therefore it's shrinking in size. 
I hook up this motor level stem. It goes back to muscle physiology, right? Sodium potassium pump occurs, depolarization. You have the hoop, bam. You, I'm not going in depth into it. You know this. These two handouts I have on line on Blackboard. We have comparison of physiologically versus electrically induced muscle contractions. So if I just contract my muscle on my, by myself, that is this here on the left. My small diameter slow twitch muscle fibers occur to first. Uh, slow onset of fatigue on all this you can read. If I hook it up on the machine electrically, faster onset of fatigue and the large diameters are increased first, or, or contracted first, recruited first. Right? So you can look at this chart, it's not very big, and see the differences between the physiologically induced and electrically induced changes. Same thing here, the spinal levels of pain control. We have ascending and descending and descending, and then what is actually going on, center biasing, the different tract cells. I'm not as worried you understand the spinal levels of pain control. I'm more worried that you understand the physiological versus electrically induced contractions. 46 minutes in. Ooh, it's going to be a long one, guys. Sorry. Okay, current attributes influencing contraction. We have pulse amplitude or frequency. The strength of contraction increases as the intensity of the current increases. Depth of penetration of current increases as the peak current increases. We're basically recruiting more nerve fibers with the frequency. Phase duration is the phase chain charge. Amount of current delivered by each phase determines the quality and quantity of muscle contraction. Phase duration of 200 to 400 microseconds recruits motor nerves. The shorter phase duration requires greater amplitude, right, to evoke an action potential. So if it's a short duration, we need a greater amplitude or height of that wave to evoke an action potential. And we can manipulate this on each machine. Longer than 400 microseconds, right, this phase duration of 400 microseconds, we start recruiting pain fibers. Do we want to recruit pain fibers? Maybe, but you have to know what the goal of the treatment is, right? Pulse frequency. Pulse rate less than 15 pulses per second. They're distinguishable muscle contraction of each pulse. Summation. As each pulse frequency increases, the amount of summation increases until muscle reaches tetany or contraction. Instead of having a, a twitch like my hand here, it's going to have a complete contraction. This usually occurs between 30 and 40 pulses per second. So instead of doing like a heartbeat, a muscle twitch, once it reaches that threshold, tetany occurs, and it's stuck there, and then you can decrease it and have it pulse again, all right? When will we use this? In your heads right now, think about when you might use a pulse frequency like this. Ooh, here you go. If we have low twitch, low pulses per second, all right? Individual muscle contractions occur. If we have medium or summation, so the adding of these, increase in muscle, mus muscle tone, almost said muscle. If we have over 40 pulses per second, this is a steady constant contraction. So maybe we're hooking up a patient for the first time after their ACL reconstruction on stem, and they don't have a quadriceps. They can't even contract their quad. They cannot physiologically contract their quad because their brain kind of forgot how to do that. Maybe the first time we do this, the low twitch. Then the second time we do this summation. Then maybe the third time we do this tonic. All right? This neuromuscular reeducation involves teaching right, a muscle how to contract again. We're establishing that neural feedback or neural pathway to restore voluntary contraction. We do this with a low duty cycle and ramping. Remember, up and then back down. The low duty cycle allows muscle to relax, recover between contractions. The pulse frequency is usually 60 pulses per second. And guess what? You may actually have some DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness after. Strength augmentation. 
we really don't use stim for this much. Pain control. This is the bread and butter of stim, essentially. Electrical currents are used to reduce the amount of pain. Assist in either the healing process or affect the transmission and perception of pain. You'd have, you'd have high pulse frequency, short phase duration, sensory level, currents that activate the gate control mechanism pain modulation. Stimulating sensory nerves close to the gate of the transmission of pain. So in this lecture, we're not going over, okay, this modality should be set at this, then this setting, and this setting. That's next lecture on clinical application of electrical modalities. If you use a low pulse frequency, a moderate pulse duration, and high intensity stim, noxious level stim, this releases beta endorphins. It's like that runner high thing, right? The anterior pituitary gland is releasing endorphins, and enkephalon is released from the spinal cord, causing that pain relief. This is like the endogenous opiates. You can get addicted to stim, and this is why. We're essentially creating a high for that patient if we use this form. High pulse frequency, motor level stim triggers the release of enkephalons. I've seen that before. Initial phases of pain control electrical currents stimulate the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. This causes a decrease in nerve conduction of small pain carrying nerves that reduces the amount and rate of noxious impulses up the spinal cord and right to the brain. Large motor nerves decrease nerve conduction uh, decreases amount of pain producing muscle spasm in the treated area. So now that pain spasm pain cycle, now if we stimulate the large motor nerves, we're decreasing the amount of spasm, which in turn decreases the amount of pain, which in turn decreases the amount of spasm. So we break that pain spasm pain cycle. Awesome chart, no list chart. I'll put this on your next test, which is at the end of the uh, next week. Sensory level, motor level, and noxious level approaches for stim for pain control. If we use a sensory level pain control, we're stimulating the target tissue of A beta fibers. You can see the phase duration, the frequency, and what intensity that patient would feel at submotor because it's a sensory level, right? Sensory level, they're not really feeling much. So this phase duration of pulse frequency, we should be able to manipulate on almost every electrical stimulation machine. I don't ever say every machine because some manufacturers have it preset that you cannot actually adjust some of these different variables. If we want to target motor nerves for motor level pain control, phase duration, you can see the pulse frequency, either very low, 2 to 4, or 80 to 120. And then they should have contraction, right? And then the noxious level stim, A delta and C fibers, we're, we're getting at. And as painful as can be tolerated. So what that means is, okay, I'm going to turn up the machine. Tell me when you can begin to feel it. I'm going to turn it up so it causes a little bit of pain. Once you begin to feel it, tell me. Okay, now I keep turning it up. Tell me when it becomes painful. Once it becomes painful, I have them tell me. And then I can either say, okay, I'm going to leave it here. And then in five minutes, I'll turn it up. Because remember, accommodation and habituation. Or I can turn it up to be painful. I personally don't usually turn it up to that patient as painful. Um, I usually turn it up to the point that they barely feel it. The spinal levels of pain control. That was another handout. It's up there on Blackboard. I already had it up there. Um, yeah. Blood flow. What is muscle electrical, sorry, electrical stimulation due to blood flow? Muscle contractions are needed for electrical stimulation to increase blood flow in muscle. Sensory level stimulation does not evoke any changes in muscle or skin blood flow. Really doesn't do much. Wound healing, low intensity direct current or high volt pulse stimulation may reduce the time needed for superficial wound healing. There's actually some research out there, but it's only on like uh, bed sores, ulcers, if you will, 
in that geriatric population or bedridden population, maybe the population like a quadriplegic there have a spinal cord injury and they can't necessarily move, right? Um, and they develop bed sores. Very little research is out is is out there on athletic trainers using this for wound healing. I personally haven't really used a stem for wound healing on any patient that I can think of. Um, yeah, PTs may actually use this. You actually may see this in a physical therapy inpatient setting um, with like the military. Um, Patients with shrapnel wounds, gunshot wounds, uh, bomb, you know, blast wounds. I could see them using this. But in athletic training, we don't typically use this as much. One, there's very little research out there. And two, I guess I, I'm, ATs are working a lot more with the military. I mean, I have some friends that work in, as military ATs. So maybe they are using this. Maybe I'll, I'll text them later and, and see what they have to say. Control and reduction of edema. That sensory level stim is theorized, theorized, right? It's not proven, it's theorized to inhibit edema formation. This prevents the fluids from escaping into surrounding tissues or really trying to prevent the secondary injury from occurring. If edema is already formed, it's already there, we can do motor level stim to assist the venous and lymphatic systems in returning the edema back to the torso. I say torso, um, really back to the lymphatic system. Um, so motor level, because we're creating that pumping action, right, can help in returning that edema back. In acute trauma, just sprain your ankle, let's say, Sensory level HVPS, high volt pulse stimulation HVPS, applied to or directly around the area, has shown to limit the volume of edema formed in lab animals. Awesome. How does that translate to humans, though? There's this whole section of biology and science, and ATs are jumping in this bandwagon of translational research. We, as clinicians, create questions that can be answered in a biology lab with animals, right? Using this, and then in turn, the lab bench researchers can give us answers for a clinical practice or give us questions that they may have, right, in the clinical aspect. So it's translational research. It goes both ways from bench, the science lab portion, to bedside, the clinical aspect. Attempting once, uh, let's get back to your essential level of edema control. So attempt uh, once edema is formed may inhibit for the reduction, but we don't necessarily know. And it could be per patient. You could still try this on a patient, but I, you don't know if it'll work. Right? I think I've had some success using high volt stim with swelling, but maybe that I have a skewed opinion. I don't know. You have to keep an open mind with a lot of these different forms. Motor level edema, I can't talk, motor level edema control. This is less controversial. This has more clinical efficacy. Muscular contractions encourage the, encourage the venous and lymphatic return by squeezing the vessels, moving fluids proximally towards the torso, or distally, I guess, and milking the fluids of the area. Taconic or teton, I can't, we... Where I live right now is actually in the Taconic Mountain Range. So I can't say Technic. I always say Taconic, like the Taconic Mountains. Technic <laughs> contraction that forces fluids proximally and then is followed by a relaxation period. So contract, contracts, relaxation, contracts, relaxes. So it's that pumping action that can help push the fluids back out. So there's some research studies out there. Electrodes placed following a vein. Exiting the swollen area, so if you know where the veins are, if you put low pulse frequency, 50% duty cycle, output intensity adjusted so contractions within the patient's tolerance actually does show some uh, motor level edema control. I don't think I've actually ever done that. Fracture healing. Bone, bone growth generators uh, attempt to produce EMF, so electrical magnetic frequencies that mimic bone's electrical signals. This encourages deposition of calcium through increased osteoblastic activity. 
we'll talk about ultrasonic bone growth stimulators later in ultrasound. Fracture healing with stim, not much. All right, you're going to have bone stimulators, the ultrasonic or, or lipus, low intensity pulse frequency. These are some contraindications of electrical stimulation. There's a lot more in your book. This is why we would never use stim, all right, on this patient. If they have a cardiac issue. Pacemakers. You can use stim on a patient with a pacemaker to a point. Nowhere near the chest. Well, you won't use it over the heart anyways. Uncontrolled hemorrhage, sites of infection, blood clot, pregnancy, cancer. Why? We're changing cell ion concentration, which can mutate the cell. And if they have cancer, you can actually cause the cancer to spread. Exposed metal implants, history of seizures, sensory or mental impairment, unstable fractures. There's more in your book, as I said. Different precautions. I really actually don't know why menstruation is a precaution. I truly don't know physiologically why. Areas of nerve sensitivity, unfused epiphyseal plates. So unfused epiphyseal plates, that would be... Um, an adolescent, so as a child and a teen, right, going through puberty, your epiphyseal plates at the end of bones start fusing. There's some research out there on younger children with stim that could actually cause some issues, uh, depending if we, like, we place the, the stim at the end of the bone, right? Communication impairment, so if they can't necessarily communicate with you, uh, to talk to you, how the stim feels, if it hurts, if it's painful, etc. Uh, severe obesity because of the impedance of the skin and fat. And then electronic monitoring equipment. ECGs or heart rate monitors. If they're wearing a polar heart rate monitor for some kind of study, they probably shouldn't be hooked up to stim. And I put this on here because I've had patients with uh, under house arrest. Yes, I should never have to put this, but yes, you will probably see this in your career. If they're wearing uh, the ankle monitoring device, that could actually, this electrical stimulation could actually screw up or mess with the electrical signal that's being input or uh, I guess uh, output from that ankle monitoring device and could cause them some serious issues. Crazy what we have to think about these days. Don't use presets. Okay, so almost done here. There's a lot going on in this chapter. It's a a lot of the physiological mechanisms of why we would use certain things and when. It makes more sense to use clinical decisions to use selective currents. You must know what's going on physiologically though, and don't use presets. So when you turn on the machine, you hit high volt or you hit interferential current and you hit pain, bam, it's all right there for you. The, the phaser rage, the amplitude, all that stuff. Don't use that. Don't be a knobologist, remember that, right? It is good to understand the physiological mechanisms that are going on here and being able to manipulate the variables for what you want for that specific patient. Remember, part of evidence-based practice in medicine is treat the patient, patient values. Understand your goal, but also remember the patient values. Every patient is different. Okay, so next chapter, we will actually talk about um, the clinical application of electrical stimulation.